Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome, take two. Welcome back to Chillcast. Um, I'm very excited. Today, we have a very special guest. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Hi, my name is Spencer Rothbell, and I'm an animation writer and voice actor in cartoons. Um, and yes, uh, a couple weeks ago, cool, I guess now, like a couple months ago, um, I direct messaged you. Um, sounds so formal. Um, about potentially sending a an autograph to one of my friends because I I had told you that I was a huge fan of Clarence and everything and um and then you said hey why not just send an audio message and by the way I already told you this but my friend Taylor absolutely loved it oh good <laughs> uh, for context uh, audience he sent a message as Clarence as the character and um, he just thought it was awesome so I'm um, just. Thanks again for that. But that is the origin story of all of this. Um, and you said, uh, I don't know if jokingly at first, you said, hey, when when can I be on the podcast? And I think I just lost my mind when you said that. Um, <laughs> no, it wasn't a, not a joke at all. I was like, well, hey, you're doing a podcast. Let's let's do it. It sounds fun. So j just to get us started, um, I had like some, some prepared questions. I wanted to start off with, uh, what did you see yourself doing when you were a kid, like job wise or just in the future? Yeah, I think when I was a kid, I was really into comics and like I like drawing comics and I just thought that's what I would do was make comics. Um, but at the same time, like I would always be making video projects with friends. Like anytime at school, there was a chance to do something that was like, taking a home video camera and just making some goofy video f with friends, like instead of writing an essay or instead of whatever else, what other, other option there could be, uh, I would always want to do that. So it's like, I felt like making things creatively telling stories was always there, but I don't, I don't think I knew exactly that I would end up doing things in animation. Um, I always loved animation as well, but, yeah, I think if you asked me when I was a kid, I'd be like, "Oh, I want to make I want to make comics." I think that was what it was. That's awesome. Um, I also uh, tried to like I not I also had an interest. I still have an interest in comics, um, but like when I was in middle school, I tried um, starting my own comic, and I I tried to sell it at a local comic book store and everything. And uh, didn't really work out, but like I still have an interest in art, so I think you know it's important to keep those interests close to your heart and like not just give up on it if the first thing doesn't happen, you know that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that you know, even though I'm I'm working as a writer and I'm doing voice stuff, it's like it's still in the realm of animation, which is sort of tangentially related to comics and. I think, you know, storytelling and being creative. So, yeah, I think you don't always know exactly where you're going to end up, but I feel like really happy with where I'm at, you know, at the same time. That's awesome. Um, and just, I, I was just genuinely curious, how did you start working as a writer and voice actor? Like, how did you get into that field? And like, specifically, how did you get working, get into working with Cartoon Network? Yeah, um, so I went to school at CalArts, um, which is like an art school in Santa Clarita. And I went to school for this program called Experimental Animation, which was, uh, they have two animation programs. One is called Character Animation, one is called experimental animation and the character program it's my understanding is like a little bit more traditional um kind of more like the pixar disney model of like traditional storytelling and uh really focused on kind of skill sets like life drawing and, and storyboarding that type of thing whereas the program i was in experimental is a little more self-directed and and you know there's overlap between the two but it, uh, there were also people that made more abstract films or things to be shown in a gallery space and that type of thing. Um, but yeah, I was, I was really interested in animation. And so I met some people at CalArts that went on to uh, work on Clarence. 
and they remembered me and and they always thought I was funny and they like that I was kind of like minded and um so they brought me on as a writer but I was really green I didn't have a lot of experience and so it was like a lot of testing out over you know sort of interview process over months of uh me submitting materials like samples of writing and uh episode ideas that type of thing and then even when I came on I was kind of doing like rewrites like they would be like okay the network has this note can you uh address this note and like rewrite this scene or can you make this funnier rewrite these jokes or dialogue or whatever and then after a while I was writing my own full episodes uh so when I tested I wrote two episodes one was went on to become uh Jeff's new toy and then the other one is the slumber party episode <laughs> uh, those those two were like the I wrote Jeff's new toy first and they were like oh this first season like the network really wants all the episodes to be more about Clarence like this is too much about Jeff can you write one more about Clarence so then I wrote the slumber party one which had like the B plot about Jeff and Sumo um, so yeah it was like really learning kind of on the job for the most part like I I felt like because my the program I was in it was more geared towards like the skill set of animation. Um, I didn't really know a lot about the animation, like TV industry. So yeah, I learned a lot on the job. And I remember just asking people like, okay, what is this person's job? What do they do? What does this mean? You know? Um, and then eventually our head writer left the show and I was promoted to the head writer on that show. Um, and then the voice of Clarence uh, left the show and I took over as the voice. So that was because I, I was doing a lot of like temp like audio for animatics as as Clarence and other characters um and so they asked me to audition and I did so it's like a really crazy like <laughs> whirlwind first basically first animation job to go from like zero to 100 really fast um mm-hmm. which I'm, I'm grateful for but it was also like a crazy experience in other ways too so so how did you like record the auditions um well I, they just had me come in like everybody else. So we auditioned like, I want to say like a hundred people or something for Clarence. So at that point I was the head writer. And so like, I was listening in with the showrunner to all these auditions and it just felt like no one was quite nailing it. And then eventually they asked me to audition and I did. And, um, yeah, everyone just had the same, uh, script to go off of. It was like a selection of dialogue from an episode and yeah and so I did it and they liked it and that that was it and then I kind of just went from there so yeah majority of the show the voice is me and then I say like every episode of the show apart from the pilot I didn't work on the pilot I was brought on after that um but every episode of the show apart from that like I had some kind of writing in it one way or another wow um so what advice would you have uh, to people trying to get into voice acting? Maybe not specifically at Cartoon Network, but just in general? Like, Yeah, um, for voice acting, I would say you, I mean, it's, it's kind of similar to, to becoming like an actor, a live action actor. It's, it's a lot of auditioning and um, making a real... Um, so yeah, make a reel, just samples of different voices that you can do to show off your range. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, just, you can start off working on student films, maybe do some voice acting. If you have a friend that's making an animated project or something like that, um, that's the way to go. Just kind of do it on your own and put stuff out there. I think there's like a couple websites for like non-union voice acting stuff like voice one two three or voices.com or something like that where you can kind of just like upload a profile and people can seek you out and uh hire you on for projects and then yeah hopefully after a while you get kind of enough of a portfolio under your belt that you can start to get bigger roles maybe go out for commercials that type of thing um and then if you get to the point where you can get representation and they'll send you auditions and that kind of thing. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's nice nowadays because you just kind of do it from home and, um, just upload audio files to 
websites and it's uh, pretty convenient in that sense. Like post pandemic, it's pretty streamlined. I, I did, I did notice that like, um, as soon as the pandemic hit, like, um, a lot of people obviously had to get microphones for their job, mm-hmm. um, in general, whether it was creative or not. But, um, and I always just thought it was funny, like f- people like kind of, it was just kind of, it was cool, obviously, but it was obviously for a depressing reason, but like, it was cool to see so many people get into the world of audio specifically, like realizing, oh wait, I can't just plug this microphone straight into my computer. I have to get an interface. And then like, cause I had like friends who talked to me about that and like, you know, just, it was, it was a cool moment to see people who would new- normally have no interaction with audio be like oh now i need to understand this can you help me understand this um yeah but yeah definitely like working in animation like <clears throat> excuse me i it's it was interesting because you know i started on clarence in like 2013 wow 14, something like that so it's like been been like 10 years and uh it's crazy to have started like right on the cusp of everything going to streaming and then also like before the pandemic and after the pandemic like i feel like the animation industry changed a lot in that time where like you know on clarence we were making it for tv for cartoon network specifically and now it's like everything that's being made it's kind of either being made directly for a streaming service or even if it's being made for cable or for a tv network it's kind of also being made with the streaming service in mind, like a package deal sort of thing. Um, so it's been, it's been interesting to see how that all changed. And then, and then, yeah, like the entire pandemic working from home and like figuring out how to do a writer's room from home and like voice acting from home, all of that, like, it's just really different, you know? So, um, what was your favorite, uh like recording experience on clarence specifically yeah i mean i'll say in general like something i really loved about clarence was that as much as possible we tried to do like a cast record which is where like everyone's in the record booth at once and there's everyone has their own microphone and you kind of just like give each other a little bit of breathing room to like record but you're all doing it at once so What I like about that, which not every show is like that. I don't know how many people realize that, but like some shows, it's just every actor is kind of just split and you're just, you come in, you record your lines by yourself and you leave. And what I loved about that is it gave us all room to improvise and like work off of each other's energy. And like if someone ad libs something funny, you kind of, you know exactly like what um, direction they're going for with their character. So you kind Mm -hmm. of know how to respond. And um, that was felt really special because even since then not every show i've been a part of with voice acting has done that um and you know we it was like most of the time at least like the main cast which was like you know me as clarence uh tom kenny who is sumo um sean gambroni is jeff and then um you know like uh Mary and Chad and Belson and all these other characters, like kind of the main core cast, everybody uh, together in the booth, uh, that felt really, I don't know, it just felt like you're this little family, like you're this little group of people trying to make each other laugh and have fun. And um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I when I started, I definitely felt way like in over my head. I didn't have a lot of experience. And everyone was like really welcoming and I just learned a lot through like osmosis, like just observing these people like, you know, Katie crown and, uh, who voices Clarence's mom and teacher, Miss Baker and, um, you know, Tom Kenny, and just these people that are such pros and like, uh, figuring it out kind of by watching them. And yeah. I mean, one experience I really loved was, uh, we did an all improvised episode, Oh my gosh. Um, with with uh, Brendan Small from Home Movies. I was like a big fan of Home Movies. So that was really cool. Um, and so that was fun to just like go in and be able to just kind of ad lib and play around and have fun. Um, and then uh, Stephen Neary, who was our showrunner at the time, like had to go through like hours of audio, and, like, <laughs> 11 minutes, and like have it still make sense. So, like, <laughs> I was really really impressed by that because I wasn't really part of that part of the process. Um, I mean, I wrote like a really loose outline and then like 
you know, we kind of knew like, okay, in this scene, like this character is going to get to this point and like, they're going to say this thing. But other than that, it was like really open. So that was really fun. Um, what ep- yeah, what was episode cool. was that? Oh, sorry. I think it's, uh, I think it's called video store. Video store. Um, that sounds familiar. So if, if, if you watch the show, if you have HBO Max, that's the only streaming platform in the U.S. that has, like, every episode on it. Um, so Hulu is missing, like, 26 episodes or something at, at the oh, end, man. like, the final episodes. So if you're watching on Hulu, there's, like, a big chunk that you haven't seen that are on HBO. Uh, so that's just a PSA for anybody <laughs> fan out there that is, is, has only seen the show on Hulu. Uh, there's, like, a bunch more that aren't HBO. And weird, weirdly enough, HBO Max took the show down for like two weeks and then put it. Back. I saw that. I saw I don't that. Know what happened there? But <laughs> so I, I worked on another show called Victor and Valentino. Oh, I love that show. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So I, I was like running the writers' room on the final season of that, and like we uh, we wrote it with streaming in mind. So we ended up switching the storytelling to be more of like one continuous narrative arc, uh, and that one dropped on HBO Max and then they took it all down so it's like not really streaming on any of like the main platforms. I think you can still like buy it on Amazon or something or like iTunes. But yeah, so like they took that down and I was like they kept taking all these Cartoon Network shows down. I was like, "Oh, they're going to I just know they're going to take Clarence down one day." And then it happened and you know, I was so sad and then yeah, it was only a couple weeks and they put it back up. So I don't know what what that was about but at least it's up for now so that's good i th- i don't know if i obviously i'm not an expert um but like if it, if it works how i think it works like maybe they thought oh let's see what shows we can trim off so we don't have to spend i don't know i don't know like do you buy like when you i don't know <laughs> when you're a streaming service do you buy the title or the license and then is it like a subscription or do you have do you have to continue paying it or do you buy it one time and you just can stream it anytime like i don't know yeah i mean all i know is that it was somehow related to there were like a lot of mer- big corporate mergers going on like between like at&t and turner and time warner um uh warner media and so like hbo max and cartoon network are basically owned by the same entity um and yeah, I think then there was this like WB merger where you similarly to like, you know, there was that like uh Bat Batgirl movie that was also scrapped that like they had shot the whole thing and then like it yeah. aired and I think it was kind of a lot of the Cartoon Network shows were being cut in that same vein and like I, I kept hearing all these different versions of, of why. Like you know, some people were saying it was like a tax write off of some sort. <laughs> And then other people were saying it had to do with like paying for like server space. And then I heard a rumor like, oh, no, they're going to like sell them off to other streamers like Netflix and license them out. And I honestly don't exactly understand why that happened and why they cut all a whole because it wasn't just, you know, Victor and Valentino it was like a ton of shows were being cut. Um, and a lot of them were Cartoon Network shows, but. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know. I don't, I don't really get it. I mean, I think it's something that's just like some kind of big, uh, I don't know, whatever, money-saving down the line uh, decision in some way that like is it's, you know, like from, from a creative standpoint, like for someone who's on this side of things, it's like hard to understand. Like, I guess maybe naively I just assumed like, well, you, you already have this thing. It's completed. It's been produced why not just have it up forever but maybe maybe there's there's some logic to it that's like purely financial that i don't quite understand but i just think it's like i mean from the the very very minute amount of knowledge i have about streaming services and how they work i just think it's silly to drop like cartoons that are have a known fan base or at least a very like committed fan base because like i don't think i've ever talked to somebody that said they've disliked Clarence or they've disliked Victor and Valentino. Like, like most people have like either a neutral opinion or they have a very high opinion of the show. Like, um, like I brought it up to one of my friends. I was like, Hey, have you seen that uh, Clarence episode? Like a couple of years ago, I was just having a normal conversation. And they're like, Oh my gosh, I love that show. I can't believe you're talking about it. Not enough people are talking about it. And so like, I just don't understand it because like from a, if you're going to, you know, go strictly on profit, it's like, that show is 
one of the main things that's going to bring people to the service, like, you know, their nostalgia and their, you know, desire to watch cartoons they liked again. Like, I just think it's kind of silly, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think also what's cool about it, Aaron, or streaming on HBO Max is like, it seems like a lot of people that hadn't really maybe never gave it a shot when it was on TV are discovering it. So there's kind of a new audience for it too, hmm. which is something that I was hoping would happen. And like, you know, just from what I've seen online, it seems like a lot of people are like, Oh, I never really watched this show. Now I'm like marathoning it. And I actually really like <laughs> it. And, you know, I, I thought it was going to be this other kind of thing and I ended up really liking it. So I always say like, Oh, I just hope people give it a shot. If like, maybe they saw a commercial and they're like, Oh, this looks annoying or weird or something, you know, like, like, uh, I never felt like the way it was advertised, like completely get, did it justice to like what we were going for anyway. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's cool. It's cool to see that. And like, I don't know how old you are, but it's also crazy to hear people saying like, Oh, like I have nostalgia for it. Like, <laughs> well, <laughs> like, like to it's, it's cool to, to think of like maybe people that were kids when it first came out and then like now are a little bit older and maybe can appreciate it in a different way or something. So I was in, uh, so when did, when did, uh, Clarence first air? I think the pilot came out in 2013 and then the series itself premiered in like 2014, 2014. So I was in like late middle school, early high school, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so that was like, yeah, that was like, you know, big, big, big time, big time for me. Um, and so I just remember watching that show a lot, like after school, uh, right now, obviously, I'm in college. Um, I'm around, I'm 19. Um, so, uh, but like, I, I mean, I, I think it's fair to say like nostalgia, because like, like, uh, I have distinct memories associated with like the shows that I watched and everything. And so, like, just in general, um, I have like funny memories of like certain like certain scenes associated with certain like just like happy memories. Like I remember watching this one part where Sumo's dad, he drives up to a gas station and he pulls up on the wrong side of the pump. And so he stretches like the, oh, yeah. the gas pump all the way around the car and then drives off and it explodes. And it's just never addressed ever again. There's like no consequences for the fact that he detonated an entire gas station. Like I it just, it, just stuff like that. Just like, I love just thinking of those scenes, like skipping back, you know, cause I had like cable, show my dad or my mom like hey come look at this like and um my, my dad's favorite character is sumo he does like he likes to do the voice you know whenever we reference the show um but yeah no i just think i think it's cool that there's like a new audience for it because um, that, that's always the hope i guess like when it comes to something you, you create or work on is that if it maybe doesn't get it's you know it's the right amount of attention at first if it like if it lives on and then gets like an explosion like later on i think that's like really cool yeah definitely yeah i mean it's just cool to see that like it means something to people out there and like i always felt like it, it almost felt like we're making this weird thing that wasn't for everyone and like we didn't quite know if people would get what we were going for and yeah, it's like it's really grounded and realistic at some points and then it gets like really cartoony <laughs> and crazy and like I think people maybe didn't quite get like which which version of a show it was or something or like that it they didn't understand that it could be both where it's like, okay, is it like King of the Hill or is it like this crazy sort of Spongebobby show? And yeah. I think it was just kinda everything we liked. We were just mushing it together, so I I think it's that's another great quality I think that that show has is just um that like the just alone like the family structure pre structures present in the show and like different types of families and different types of like relationships people have like um you know and like n not to like get all like dramatic but like just differences in class mm -hmm. and everything yeah, like I, mean, I yeah yeah that's, that was all intentional i mean like i think like the messaging of of uh you can have any configuration of of a family unit and that's still a family and you know like jeff having two moms or you know sumo maybe not having as much money as some of the other kids and living in a trailer with all these siblings uh and then you have belson who's definitely a lot wealthier and 
Clarence. He has like a single mom with a boyfriend. Um, and I think, yeah, that was always kind of by design to show like, hey, all these kids can be friends and they can still have like loving parents and that's still a family unit. And it doesn't yeah. to look like what we've seen mostly represented on TV and hopefully give kids out there whose families might not look like a lot of families they had seen previously represented a little bit more representation and the feeling that like, Oh, okay. Yeah. This is normal. This is fine. You know? And that, that's just another one of the, uh, one of the many things I love about the show. Um, I think what Lion says it best um, or just describes that best is um, in, I think in the first episode of like the first official episode of Clarence, uh, Clarence, I think it's like Clarence has a day, a fun day with a girl or something. I think that's like the title. Um, pretty great day with a girl. Yeah, pretty pretty great day with a girl. Um, he he's talking to her and she's like moving and he's like, oh, he, she's like, oh, so are your parents? Uh, something about your parents? And he's like, um, um, I live with my mom and my and Chad. Um, I don't have a dad, but I have a Chad and he's pretty cool. And I just that that line itself just when I first saw it, like it kind of made me tear up a little bit. I'm not going to lie just because like, just to see him because Clarence in itself, like the character is like the nicest person on that planet. Like he never gives up on people. And when he does, it's like really, really like heartbreaking to see. And so like when he just kind of expresses that, like just optimism and like happiness with like himself and like his family and everything, it was just like nice to see. And it just goes back to the like, representation and everything, just like to see that he's like very happy with his life and how, you know, his family is constructed. And it's it's very it's a very tame way of just showing that kind of message, I think. Yeah. And I think that was always, you know, like a lot of times people would ask, like, well, who's his real dad? Like, who's his biological dad? And I always felt like doing an episode about that would kind of undercut that idea. Where yeah. it's like the whole point is that we don't need to talk about that. Like, it's not relevant. Like, just like how, you know, we don't like Jeff has two moms and that's who his parents are. And like, that's it. Like, and he's happy with that. And yeah. So, like, I think I think that was always kind of the idea that, like, it's that's fine. And like showing how the characters are like content with that is important. And um, yeah, I think also going back to what you said about, like, representing it in a subtle way like that through dialogue or uh, that was always like the idea for us too where we never wanted to feel like we we're being preachy or like heavy-handed about anything where yeah it was almost like this this uh philosophy of storytelling where it's like okay we're just going to represent this scenario as like truthfully as we can and then whoever's watching it it's up to them to kind of interpret the meaning however they want and kind of make up their mind about how they feel about it. Um, so I think I think that's also really important to to me in terms of the writing to maintain that uh, sensibility where it's not like okay we're we're telling the audience this is how you should feel about this issue or this person's bad and wrong and this person's good and they're right and it was more just kind of left open to interpretation. I think that was always like something that we we wanted to respect kids watching too where. You know, I think we were feeling frustrated where when we were growing up, there was a lot of stuff made for kids that felt like it was almost like talking down to them. Yeah. And we always we always thought like, OK, it's it's more important for us to just, you know, especially making a show about the experience of being a kid um, to do that in a way that felt true to life and, and was respectful and that it was like, hey, like we understand that these things are important to you and that's real and like that's what it's like to be a kid and you're just like a younger person like uh i think that was always something that we tried to keep in mind as much as we could and uh, i that's just what makes that show so great that show so great um i think it really does capture what it's like to be a kid because um mo most shows um that obviously i'm a huge fan of um are are fiction more fictional than others in the sense that like you can love the characters but like there's not really much attainability in the sense that like you like you can still enjoy it um but like you don't you don't you go oh i remember i had a time like that i had a day like that or i had a memory like that like for example steven universe i'm i'm a fan of steven universe but like you know realistically um 
I can only really enjoy it from like a viewer's perspective, but with like Clarence and shows like that have more of a grounded perspective, I can go, Oh my gosh, my friends were just like that. Um, we, we did this after school. Um, and that's not to like diss other shows in any way. Like, I think it's important to have great, great shows that are fictional and very like expansive and, um, you know, something more like, like, I guess, I don't know how to say it, like larger than life or just like, you know, exploring things that may seem impossible, but like are just cool to see. But I don't know, I'm going on a tangent. The point is, I like Clarence because of its groundedness. I like the idea that um, kids can see that show and go, oh, I've, I've been there and or I've experienced that kind of thing with my friends or, you know, just saying, oh, my gosh, my friend is just like sumo or something like that. Yeah, I mean, that was another way that we'd write stories, too, is like, we would come from the place of like, okay, well, what's an experience that one of us maybe had as a kid that we've never really seen on TV before? And how would we maybe do a version of that story with the characters? Or maybe it's something we have seen on TV, but the TV version of it kind of gets it wrong. Like, what is <laughs> what does this actually feel like? You know, like what's like the cheesy version you've seen a million times on TV? And then like, what well, what would really happen? Or how does that actually make you feel as a kid? And trying to come to that conclusion. Um, and I also say like, yeah, like there, there are a lot of shows that are more fantastical. And I feel like those shows, they're still tackling real things. And yeah. Yeah. And emotions, but they're just using the fantasy as like a metaphor to kind of represent them. Um, and I also say Clarence goes to like really crazy, fantastical places sometimes too. <laughs> and like, I feel like, we would use a lot of the time it's like, oh, it's through his imagination or it's like a dream or he's giving a presentation at school and he's telling a story or, you know, we we would often like figure out little ways to get around like, OK, we want to do this like crazy weird thing. And like, <laughs> how, can we, how can we make it work within the framework of this show? Like, oh, OK, it's like we're using some, you know, a shift like we're seeing this from a different character's perspective and it's going to change animation styles or whatever. Like, so it does get really experimental sometimes too, but yeah, we always wanted there to, for the most part, I think there's a few exceptions, but we, for the most part, we would always have that kind of grounded reality in there. And, and maybe the, the, the shift in that was like a joke or like a, a shift in perspective, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, the, the, one of the first episodes that comes to mind is just, uh, um, the the dollar hunt the dollar hunt episode so like yeah they've all Clarence has invited his friends and then a bunch of essentially strangers um, but like friends that like go to school with him that he doesn't really know very well and he hides like he hides I think the plot twist is that he hides like a lot more than one dollar for people to hide I think for, for people to find I think it's like the money that his mom gave him for grocery shopping or something. Yeah, I forget. Yeah. Like <laughs> he, he, bill yeah. <laughs> yeah, he he hides that. And um just like the just seeing that whole like scene play out, like they're just the whole entire episode takes place in the backyard. So, you know, it's very real like, hey, I have my friends over and then I invite some friends I don't really know and then you know, there's one friend in the group that like wants to be more inclusive and is like really, really happy everyone's there. And then like his other friends are kind of like standoffish at first um, about like, you know, meeting new people. And that's like not the main plot of the episode, but like they just um, just the idea of like, oh, inviting friends over and then something goes wrong and you have to try to fix it. And I mean, that that whole like. I, I don't I hate to say like sitcom ish kind of plot but like that's obviously been done a lot but i think what separates it is that it just like just the whole concept in itself of like oh it's a dollar hunt clarence set this up like that's not really been done before that i think it's just really funny and i think it's very like wholesome in a way because he's like oh we'll just you know hide some money and we'll we'll become friends by finding it and then it turns out to be the hundred dollar bill and he gets in trouble or no, i think he just like no they just make <laughs> They make um, a, a casserole with what's around in the house and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one. I mean, I think going back to what you were saying about, like, who he invites over, we would talk about a lot about this idea that, like, 
when you're a kid, you're sort of just friends with whatever kids are around you. Yeah. Like just in your neighborhood or happen to go to your school. And um, we like this idea that Clarence sort of thinks of himself as like, well, everyone's my friend. You know? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Like, even if they like him or not, like he's just like, oh, Belson, you're you're my best friend. <laughs> like, <laughs> so like, I think I think having that kind of like naive, like almost like blind optimism uh, is like a really funny aspect of the character of Clarence and like um but also sort of felt true to life where it's like yeah when you're a kid like you're just gonna hang out with whatever kids might be like living on your block like it's just yeah you know you you don't have a lot of autonomy you can't drive a car you can't like meet people like it's just whoever's (laughs) around so I think we always we always like that idea that like different episodes Clarence could be hanging out with whatever random kids from his school and like uh you know besides Jeff and Sumo and I think um, my favorite parts, one of my favorite parts of that episode, uh, is at the end the the kid who finds the uh, like the hundred dollars. I don't, I think he's like spoken like maybe like two or three times in the entire episode at this point, mm-hmm. and then he just starts like saying something in Latin, and then he runs away with the dollar. Oh right, um, he's like the conspiracy theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, I. I, I, I I don't know if this is correct, but I think he like says what John Wilkes Booth says. I don't. I I don't think that's it. I don't think that, I if mean, that's honestly it could be something like that. I don't remember, like, but that might be a Mandela effect or something. Yeah, maybe he says something that he does say like someone's a cannibal, right? Like <laughs> ex president was a cannibal. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like founding father. <laughs> Some something that I'm sure someone out there would find very blasphemous and offensive. But <laughs> I just remember in Clarence where I was like, how how do they let us say that or do that thing? It was very like very edgy in, in, in a subtle way or something, you know. I was wondering about that implications in the show. <laughs> I think like I think we would always just kind of push the envelope of like, well, this is making us laugh, and we're not doing anything like explicit or like horrible, and like hopefully people out there also think it's funny. Um, it was it was usually just like in good fun, like just being weird and trying to make each other laugh more or less. Uh, but yeah, there's there's definitely some stuff in in that show that like we got away with that I was surprised <laughs> by. Uh, we did have like a TV PG rating, which is like huh. I think the same rating as like a sitcom like Big Bang Theory or something like that, where like you can get away with like innuendo and stuff like that, but. Yeah, it always felt kind of random what they let us do or not. It was just kind of like whatever executive or uh, standards and practices person we got that month or something. Yeah. It's like, okay, sure. I don't care. Like, <laughs> keep making your cute show about kids. <laughs> just casually quoting John Wilkes Booth, you know, in Latin. Yeah, I don't know. If that's what it was, but <laughs> I don't I think. Don't know, I don't... I didn't I, get that I, particular dialogue. I can't <laughs> claim one way or another, but it's probably not. But like, uh, I do appreciate shows that kind of push push the boundaries when it comes to humor. Um, like, just nothing nothing that's like derogatory, but it's always just something that's like, oh my gosh, that's in this show. You know that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I think like with Clarence too, it's like. We did a lot of those, like, they call them, like, gross-ups, like, really detailed, like, painterly, <laughs> yeah. like a Ren and Simpy or, or Spongebob style. Like, yeah. I think those, those we push pretty far sometimes. Like, there's one episode where he got sick, and, like, he sort of deteriorates throughout the episode. Uh, he gets sick from eating, like, a bunch of deviled eggs. Uh, <laughs> and there's one of those paintings that, like, we kept going back and forth about like (laughs) the detail on it. It was like, okay, like get rid of some of these boils and some of this sweat and drool and then like change the color and then it's okay. And I think we were even like haggling about how many seconds it could appear on screen until they finally let us do it. And it's like really brief, but uh, yeah, there's, there's some like crazy episodes in there. Like there's, there's an episode average Jeff, which has references to American psycho, uh, (sighs) Which oh I, I my gosh! Know, I don't know if they knew that at the time, but like the whole intro is like basically a recreation of like the opening of that film. Um, <laughs> and I think if we put it in the outline, it's like, oh, a la American Psycho, they'd be like, no. But <laughs> I think because we didn't write it explicitly, and it was just like a direction for the board artists that uh, we kind of got away with it. Um, 
That's amazing. That's awesome. That that got yeah, like so passed. This, yeah, there's some like I mean, and that's the kind of thing where I think it's like pretty harmless because it's like okay, if you know the reference and you've already yeah. seen the movie, and if you don't, that if you're like some kid just watching it, you just think that it's some stylized opening to the show. So, kind of not really, in my opinion, hurting anybody. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's. It was definitely, I feel like grateful to have worked on something where like we got so much creative freedom. Um, and I think I didn't appreciate it at the time, uh, just knowing like, oh yeah, like not every show gets that, especially like a kid's animated show. And like, it was like a really special opportunity to just play around in the sandbox with my friends and like make this crazy thing. And um, it was also just like a really talented team of people too. Like it's such a group effort. And it's, it was like a big like labor of love where there, you know, people like I mentioned Stephen Neary before uh, he went on to create a show, The Fungies, after Clarence. Um, he was our third showrunner on the show. And like he he would do all this extra work like with uh, stop motion where, you know, he made these fully like stop motion animated sequences that were just he was just doing it in the office. Like we didn't have any kind of professional studio or anything set up. Um, you know, we didn't have the budget for it. And he was just like, all right, I'm going to do this. And similarly, like uh, other people on the show, like Nelson Bowles, like we, he would go in and like retime animation and add extra flourishes and after effects. Um, we had some like guest animators work on the show. Uh, Lindsay and Alex Small Butera, who, who created Batman, Piderman. Uh, they did a really awesome episode where the boys stay up late and like essentially start hallucinating from uh, being tired and, all the animation in those sequences was done by them. And so, yeah, we, we really got to play around and have fun. And it was like a really fun time. Are there any, um, are there any characters in Clarence that are self inserts of any of the team? Um, hmm. I mean, I'm sure there, there's definitely some characters that were, inspired by people that we knew um i'm not gonna say names because i don't know <laughs> like <laughs> I don't know, that's like a dicey territory maybe oh yeah yeah there's, there's definitely like characters where it's like oh this is like basically a kid i grew up with or like <laughs> person it's like or kind of amalgams of people like jeff and Simone and clarence like there's elements of them from uh, like real people and people's lives that worked on the show uh and then various students in the class like they're, the way they look, I, I think, like, uh, one of the character de designers um, earlier on the show, he drew a lot of his, like, classmates from college, like, caricatures of them. And those <laughs> ended up being a lot of the, like, incidental characters in the school. I mean, Belson, uh, Nelson Bowles, Belson Knowles, like, it was literally just his name <laughs> flipped. Uh, so it was, like, <laughs> sort of loosely based. I mean, the actual Nelson, like, he's, like, a good friend of mine and he's like a very nice person um he's not like a mean person <laughs> like, like belson uh but uh yeah definitely definitely some people inspired by real life i think in there uh or maybe exaggerated for comedic effect uh in yeah some ways um i think like tony infante was one of the writers on the show there's like an episode where they go to like a teenage party and they're convinced that they're oh insane. yeah and like yeah one of those guys was like a crazy caricature of him um, <laughs> so things like that uh but but yeah i mean everything a lot of the times plots stories characters elements came at least like the spark of the idea came from our lives like there's one episode where Clarence meets a kid who is like having trouble making friends because he's like constantly moving and he's always the new kid. And, and that was something that I experienced as a kid. And like, I moved my family moved around a lot. And so like, I never really seen that particular issue like represented in anything for kids. And like, I was like, Oh, I'd like to see like a character dealing with that and Clarence helping him make friends. And yeah, I think, I think that, um, there's a lot that came from our lives in the show. Like it's weirdly like really personal in some ways. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a collaboration. It was collaborative effort. Like a lot of really talented people worked on it. And uh, I think that's what made it so fun. It's like 
even if you were like a voice actor or a character designer, background designer, you know, like the, the background designers were always like putting in references to other episodes and like little hidden jokes. And um, everyone was just having a lot of fun. And like, I think everyone hopefully felt empowered to like be as creative as they wanted to be in the show too. Um, and, and, and yeah, it really felt like a team in a way that was really cool. Like, it felt like everybody was just excited about working with each other, um, which I think makes a better show, you know, like some projects I've worked on, it feels like everyone's really compartmentalized. Like, mm. You're writers, you're over there, just worry about writing. You're, um, you know, a board artist. Don't talk to the writers, just do your storyboarding. And um, I think the best stuff is when everyone's really communicative and collaborative. And it's also just the most fun and it shows in the end product, like, I feel like anytime I watch something where it's like, oh, this just seems like friends having a good time, like it gives it like such a better feeling to experience as a viewer too. I definitely agree. And I definitely got that sense uh, from watching the show myself, just like, because I, I could tell that like the characters were supposed to be caricatures of people, people could realistically know in their life. But I also felt like maybe these people are, were known by the creators in some way or, you know, but what's funny is like, you know, a good example of that is uh, Miss Baker. Um, I had a teacher in middle school who was one to one Miss Baker. <laughs> um, I think like in almost every sense, just like in her mannerisms and how like she conducted the class and how she taught and everything. And just like, yeah, just it was just so funny because like, I think if I'm remembering correctly, I think I had that teacher at the time that I had started watching the show and I just felt like this weird, like, wait a second. I feel like I know this person. And then like the next day I went to school and I was like, Oh my gosh, it's Miss Baker, but not Miss Baker. <laughs> so yeah, I think, I mean, yeah, I, I love that character. There's definitely like a, um, there was a college teacher at Cal arts that I know was like partially the inspiration for that character. <laughs> um, but then I think Katie Crown, who did the voice of uh, Miss Baker and Mary, Clarence's mom, like she brought so much personality to those characters. Uh, and she's so funny. And, you know, like she would ad lib a lot. And just from her performance, uh, she really made those characters what they are, too. Um, yeah. And, and I think that was also something, too, where we, we wanted all the characters to feel like real people and like that, you know, Miss Baker was a person beyond just being Clarence's teacher and like yeah. whatever she had going on, uh, whether it's like, you know, the episode where he's on the blind date or you know, <laughs> I love that episode. Crazy, craziness that's going on at school and her trying to like handle Clarence and his wackiness. And, um, you know, like we did these episodes, uh, the stormy sleepover. It was like a six episode story arc where we tried to pair off different groupings of characters. So there's one where she gets like locked in basically like a convenience, like a 7-Eleven with Clarence and some other characters. And it was always fun to explore some of those uh, side characters a little bit more, like especially as the series went on. Um, I think like you mentioned the uh, Blind Date episode. Um, I, I, that's one of my favorite episodes. But um, what's funny is I, I grew up with, my, both my parents are teachers. Oh, okay. So, so from the get go, I understood that teachers had lives outside of uh, school. But I was showing that episode to my mom once, and she started laughing really hard. And I was like, "Oh, what's so funny?" And she's like, "I did the exact same thing to my teacher when I saw her in the grocery store in middle school. Like, I walked up to her and I was like, "What are you doing? You're not at school. What are you doing? Don't you? What are you? What are you doing?" And, <laughs> and she just you know couldn't comprehend that teachers didn't just live at the school. Yeah, I feel like one of my favorite gags in that is, like, Clarence imagining her, like, <laughs> just sort of shutting down and, like, recharging like a robot when, <laughs> she's, when he doesn't see her at school. Like, it's just plugging a big cable <laughs> into her back and, like, going limp. I think that image was funny. And yeah. Then, yeah, there was this other one where it's, like, we tried to think of a visual metaphor for Clarence, like, having a, a light bulb moment. And we're like, oh, it's a, it's a potato falling into a mud puddle. <laughs> it's like a stop motion animated sequence where he like has a eureka moment of like oh she's a person she's not just a teacher um, 
And then I love that like weird old man character that was just like the worst possible blind date for her to be on. And we, we brought him back, I think like once or twice after that in a couple other episodes. Uh, oh yeah, La- Larry, which is uh, Larry, short for Clarence. Also named Clarence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that yeah. character in itself is a great, a great, uh, great character. Cause like in that episode, he's just like the comedic, you know, I don't know. Uh, he's a comedic character, but then like, I think there's like another episode where he's brought back and he's just like walking on the side of the road with Clarence Sumo and Jeff. And he like takes them to get ice cream and he just like writes down everything about them. And like, like he, at first, like, I mean, now outwardly you can see, Oh, that's kind of, odd but then yeah i think you you later realize he's just like this normal like guy who's kind of like maybe he has like some memory problems or maybe he has like some sort of condition that's why he has to write everything down and then because at the end like the whole wholesome like end is that like he remembers what jeff's favorite flavor of ice cream is or something like that yeah i guess we i don't know like it, it sort of developed into this guy where we're like well, what if he just is like constantly observing and like he just writes everything down but then <laughs> it sort of makes him impossible to communicate with. Like he's just consulting notes and like writing yeah. everything you're saying down and <laughs> sort of not like being present in the moment at the same time. And yeah, yeah. it just seemed like a weird kind of quirk. Like, I don't know if we ever like imagine like, Oh, he has dementia or, or anything that like serious. Like, oh. I've seen, like I've seen interpretations like that where I was like, Oh, that I feel like that's a little darker than what we thought it would be. It was more just like, Oh, he's just this like kind of eccentric guy. Yeah. Maybe he's like a bit of a hoarder. Like his home has all these like stacks of all his notes from all over the years. But he also like has gone on these adventures. Like I think there's like one picture of him like shaking hands with like Richard Nixon. Or something. <laughs> we just like, give him this like mysterious backstory. And, um, I think that was another thing that was fun about the show where it was like just kind of like throwing these wrenches into things where we're like, okay, we're going to put in this like really odd specific character detail and like never really explain what <laughs> and let the audience kind of use their imagination and figure out which, you know, I love seeing like theories about things. <laughs> that that was my fan theory was that like, he just had maybe dementia or something, um, which, you know, I don't think like detracts from like the whole character. I mean, I think it makes it more, I mean, again, it's a theory. It's obviously not official, but like, uh, I just like the I, I like the idea of that character just like being this like normal, kind of wholesome guy who's just like, he he, he cares enough to like he wants to learn everything about you. But like again, that might be just like reading too much into it. Maybe he just doesn't remember things. Or but like I just I don't know. I just like the idea of him just constantly observing, and I think that's really funny. Yeah, and we never wanted to be like, oh, this guy's like creepy or something. Like he's just like a weirdo. Like I think there's a lot of times when we're coming up with these like strange characters on the show where like the network's like, why is this old man alone with a child? It's like, <laughs> not anything like weird. Like we're not going for that. Like he's just like Clarence's neighbor, and he's like, yeah. Clarence, Clarence. I think what I love about the character of Clarence is like he sees everyone in such a positive light. Where like maybe other characters might be like, oh, this guy's strange. I don't know. And like Clarence is just like, oh, he's great. What do you mean? Like there's nothing wrong yeah. with him and he's right, you know? And like, I think what's funny about that too is like maybe Clarence can feel that way about a character like Belson or Miss Shoop where it's like sometimes a little undeserved. <laughs> where you're just like, <laughs> maybe, maybe Clarence is wrong. Like, you know, and I always thought the idea too, where it's like Clarence is like, oh, this person needs my help and I'm going to help them. And, and maybe the person is like, I just, like sometimes with Belson, it's like he's like, I just want to be left alone. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, I almost feel sorry for Belson. I'm just like, well, he's he's telling you what he wants. You're <laughs> like, Clarence can be so unrelenting, you know. Yeah. Funny about that to me. Um, I just like what comes to mind is like Clarence visiting Belson at the hospital and giving him like a huge like sub sandwich that's like comically large. <laughs> yeah, it's a party sub. <laughs> yeah, because you wanted to have a party with Wilson. It's like one of those ones that you would get, like, catered. <laughs> little, yeah. Clarence like just somehow gets it. Elevator. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> got a coupon or something. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, that one. That was one of the episodes where I was like, okay, Clarence is, is almost being like a, like... He's almost torturing Belson. Like, I think <laughs> there's 
there's part of me that was like, oh, maybe we went a little too far with this one where <laughs> Clarence comes off as a, a bit annoying at times. But like, like I can see like I, that's one of the criticisms I've heard of the show where people are like, oh, he's, Clarence is so annoying. I love Jeff and Sumo, but hey, Clarence as a character, I don't like. And I don't know. I it's hard for me to see it like that because I voice Clarence. But <laughs> I, guess, I guess I get it. I, I guess sometimes if he was a real person, I might find him annoying. But since he's not, I, I think it's funny. But <laughs> so this is a, a very like not, not a very great interview question, not a very like professional question. Uh, can, but you hold on one sec. I, I, I have to plug in my computer. It's like uh, yeah, sure. Today. One sec. Okay, hello. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. All right, I'm back. Um, so uh I have I did you write the episode where Clarence becomes like really depressed and like gets attention for the first time and like he starts like dressing up. Oh, he he shaves his head, he wears a hoodie. He gets really sad and like he's like visibly not mentally well like he's not doing okay and like he he like it's because like someone like uh took his doll from him i think yeah that's a little buddy little buddy yeah i'm looking up the credits because i want to give credit was due so yeah written by me skylar page and katie crown uh who's the voice of clarence's teacher and mom so but yeah i have the they got the story credit and then i got the written by credit so usually like Basically, the way that would work is like whoever's in the writer's room, we get the story credit because we all worked on it. And then the written by credit would go to the person who like actually wrote the episode. Uh, so, yes, I did. Just want to confirm. That <laughs> I, it, you know, there's like over 100 episodes. So sometimes I forget. Um, yeah. Who wrote what, and I just didn't want it. And especially because like I'm in the writer's room for like most of the all like basically all of them. Um so I, it feels like I wrote, at least I wrote something that's in them all. But yeah, so I did write that one. Um, Little Buddy, yeah, that one was very funny and weird and a little dark. Uh, yeah, I think I, that one was like this idea of uh, when you're a kid, you don't have a lot of agency or autonomy and you're basically just kind of at the whim of adults who are around you and adults can make mistakes and do things that aren't always right. And I think Clarence like has this really strong sense of justice and right and wrong. And um, Mm -hmm. felt like his punishment was unfair. Like he was just trying to make friends and it was like a misunderstanding because no one else liked his weird doll that he liked. (laughs) He, He couldn't understand why. And uh, so then he gets put in detention by Miss Shoop, who's sort of like a school detention proctor, a recess, you know, uh, yeah, attendant, or I don't know what the name is for that. And uh, she's like, oh, yeah, you're going to. Oh, no, it wasn't detention. She puts him in timeout and it's supposed to be like a brief timeout, but she forgets about him for the entirety of recess. And then the bell rings and she realizes, oops, you know, oh, whatever it was you can go to recess tomorrow. And I think what we were thinking about at that time is like for a kid, that's like a big deal for an yeah. adult. It's like, who cares? You'll have recess again tomorrow. What's the big deal? Like who cares? It's not, a, you know, but I think it's really tough when you're a kid, when something happens that feels like, Hey, that's so unfair. Yeah. There's like no sense of justice there. And I just have to go along with it because I'm a kid and you're an adult. And that's like the power structure there. Uh, and I think, you know, like that can be really frustrating. I think there's a lot of stuff that's frustrating when you're a kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just like, it's like your whole experience is like, well, I just have to kind of do whatever I'm told. And like, whether it makes sense or not is irrelevant. Uh, yeah. I'm a kid. And like, I think there's this point, at least for me in childhood, where you kind of think like, oh, like all the adults around me, like, they're really capable and they know everything and therefore that's why I have to do everything they say. And 
And then you get to a point where you realize, like, oh, adults are just, like, older versions of kids. <laughs> Like, yeah, not everyone, yeah. No one, no one really knows everything, and no one has it all figured out, and they all have like unique problems to them, and just like kids do, and you know, they're like these emotional beings, and I think um, that episode was just us kind of dealing with that I- idea of like, hopefully giving kids this sense that like their feelings matter and they're important, and yeah. And and just this recognition that like yeah adults like aren't always right and they kind of mess up sometimes too and, like <laughs> even I think you know like as an adult that is funny like a kid being so distraught over missing one recess like because you have perspective but then as a kid you can also hopefully simultaneously have empathy and be like well that is really real and important for them and and it's okay to recognize that too you know like I, I think that was the key to a lot of episodes of the show for me where it's like looking back on things that you experienced as a kid and like finding what's funny about them now as an adult but then also trying to tap into like what was meaningful at the time to you as a kid and like yeah. still still being like honoring that while kind of making fun of it at the same time if that's <laughs> i think it does a good job of blending those two ideas cuz it does I, that episode like watching it from you know, my perspective, it, it it's, it's like comedic and how like dramatic it is, but it also, do, it also doesn't like invalidate Clarence's experience. Like he, cause like you, you immediately sympathize with him. Cause like recess is a huge deal, you know? And so like, you know, at that point in time in your life. And so right. like to see, to see him like one of the most optimistic, one of the most caring, uh, just like inclusive individuals, be visibly not okay like is really is really hard to watch at the same time and so like i think it does a good job like you said of blending it together of being like comedic but also validating and kind of kind of dark (laughs) yeah and i feel like every person remembers a time when they were a kid where there was like you got in trouble for something that like maybe you felt you shouldn't have or maybe some other kid picked on you and and you know, when the person, the adult shows up, it, it seems like you're in the wrong, whatever, and you're getting blamed. So I think hopefully that resonates with kids where it's like, you know, he's he's literally just trying to make friends. I mean, he's like very pushy to the point where like a kid falls over and gets hurt. Uh, but he doesn't have any malice. Like he doesn't do it on yeah. purpose. And he genuinely doesn't understand why like people don't like his creepy like Chucky Cabbage Patch Kids <laughs> Uh, which is based on a real doll called My Buddy uh, and Kid Sister. There was a line, uh, which I think is the inspiration for the one in Chucky, like the original one as well. Uh, but yeah, I think I think we also wanted to do like a creepy doll episode where it's like it doesn't come to life. <laughs> it's not what you think. It's not going to, you know, it's not haunted. It's not going to come to life. It's just a weird doll that Clarence thinks is cute and everyone else thinks is weird. <laughs> That's kind of, you know, I think also too, like the idea of like kids, like, uh, like little boys playing with dolls. Like when I was a little boy, you know, like I'm 33. So like I was a kid in the nineties and like, I think that was like still a little bit of like a taboo or it's like, Oh, boys don't play with those kind of dolls. Yeah. I had like stuffed animals and dolls and stuff like that. So I think that was another thing too. That was like sort of also in there with like, Clarence in general with like gender roles like I think we always just wanted him to be like he's like a kid like he's just having fun and like you know like there's he might put on like high heels and like whatever he might have a purse or something but it's not like drag it's just him being like oh that's what grown-ups do like he doesn't really understand those like gender roles really like it's just kind of like Whatever. Yeah. Like he he just likes whatever he likes, and like I think that was something else that we wanted to show kids. So it was okay, or it's like you can just play around and have fun and like be whatever kind of kid you want to be, and like you yeah. don't have to have this like heavy meaning, you know. I think that's a great thing about his just his character in general is that like he there are a lot of like uh, cutaway jokes or like kind of jokes where like they sometimes like they you know the whole point is that he's doing things that are traditionally like i guess like feminine you know in a sense but like sometimes it's played off as a joke uh, as like a lighthearted joke sometimes it's played off as like just him being himself and just having like a good time and it's like not you know not the butt of a joke but i think it's you know, like sometimes like like for example like uh that episode where he spends the day with that charlie brown type character 
Mm, yeah, yeah. And like they're they get stuck in a cave because of a rainstorm, and he like he's an underpass <laughs> with like a yeah. Like yeah. Random. Guy. and he's he's like really he's like like the he's like taking it super seriously and clarence is like kind of like setting up the scene like it's a sitcom and he's like oh i made i made uh muffins and he's got like an apron on and then he's like and he walks up and he's like he's like oh you're ignoring me i guess you'll have to sleep on the couch and then like laughter plays in the background and it's like you know it's supposed to be like set up like a you know a sitcom and everything like that so like there's like stuff like that in there and then there's stuff like you know him just being you know himself and i think that's really i think it's really nice to see in a cartoon that you know a lot of kids watch you know is that you can be yourself and express your gender or just your identity in, in any way and it's not like limited yeah and i think also we always had this idea too where like we never really wanted to do like Clarence is like feeling romantic and dating and all that, like because they're just so young. Like, yeah, I don't know. There's like a couple episodes that are like, like there's one where like Sumo and Chelsea kiss, and there's one where like Delson has a crush. But I think with Clarence, like we always just wanted to keep him like kind of naive and young, and like he's just a kid. Like he has friends that are girls and boys, and like he's just having fun with his friends. And, yeah, like, I don't know. It always felt a little too adult to go in that direction with it. I think like like and even in the episode where Clarence goes on a date, it's like the whole joke is that like no one, the girl he at, he goes on a date with doesn't even understand what a date is and like they just kind of like sit there awkwardly like oh wait I saw in this movie that I'm supposed to like throw my coat on, <laughs> on this puddle right right and he like throws it on a puddle and like steps on it on purpose like you know really gets it all muddy he's like here now you can walk across the road and then <laughs> yeah just stuff like that like he. You know, he doesn't understand it. She doesn't understand it. And they're like, can we just be friends? This is we don't I don't know what this is, you know? Yeah, I think that was always something we we had in mind, too, with the show where it's like, OK, if Clarence is doing this thing, like something we would see a lot on TV is like a kid acting very unusually adult in a way that made it feel like, oh, a kid wouldn't behave this way. This is just an adult writing a kid like they are an adult. And so. If we ever had that, we'd be like, okay, well, maybe this is something he's seen on TV. He's trying to replicate it, or he saw a movie or something, and he doesn't quite get what he's doing. He's, like, doing a bad job. Um, so I think that was always how we kind of would understand things like that, where it's like, he doesn't know how to be on a date, but maybe he's seen a movie where someone's on a date. So yeah. he's, like, kind of missing the point and, and <laughs> acting, like, he's play acting, like, playing house or something, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, th I think that's awesome. And, uh, I don't know, uh, I, I, before, before we end it, I want to th say thank you so much for doing this. Um, and it's, it's really cool, uh, to talk to you about like something that I'm also very passionate about in general, um, just like as animation, as a, as a medium for, you know, expressing stories and and ideas and you know you know validating kids experiences and everything i i I, th I think it's pretty cool uh that there are cartoons out there like that you know that are kind of changing the mold and everything um and my, my last question is, is this is from uh someone who watches the podcast they ask um how does it feel to play the most underrated cartoon character <laughs> I don't know if I'm the most if if Clarence is the most underrated uh <laughs> I don't know it's something that I think is uh how do I put this some of my favorite things are things that a small group of people like a lot <laughs> and I think that's how Clarence feels to me it's like the people that like it really love it and then maybe there's like a lot of other people that you know like you said earlier haven't really checked it out or they're maybe indifferent towards it or it's not for them and i think that's okay i mean i like i love like tim and eric and strangers with candy and david lynch and satoshi khan and these things that might be a little weird or like aren't everyone's cup of tea and like that's that's okay i mean that's the kind of stuff i like so if clarence is something like that then i think it's in good company and yeah, I just, I think when people like it and they get it, then it's for them and that's cool. And I had a lot of fun working on that show and I'm proud of it. So yeah, that's, that's all that matters to me. <laughs> 
Awesome. Um, well, thank you for being on the podcast. Uh, I, maybe we'll do something else in the future. Maybe I, I'd love to collaborate another way or do something else, but, uh, you know, if this is it, thank you so much for recording with me and it was great to meet you. Um, and would you like to talk about any projects that you're working on currently? Uh, yeah, I, I help a friend of mine, uh, Charlie Gavin, write on his project called Box Town, uh, which is like an indie uh, web cartoon that's currently in production. Um, it's like an adult animated series set in a world of noir detectives. Um, and it's about a kind of like washed up, grizzled uh, detective who teams up with a little orphan boy uh, who has a, invented a made up condition called dissociative rage disorder. So basically when he feels strong emotions, he like hulks out <laughs> and like kicks ass. And so this detective pairs up with him and they solve crimes together. Uh, and it's been really fun to work on something that's a little more adult. Uh, so if people want to support that, there is an Indiegogo campaign and also a Patreon for it uh, with a lot of cool rewards if you're a backer. Uh, so check it out. It's called Box Town. And uh, uh, later, if you could send me like all the links to that, I can put it in the description and everything. So that sounds awesome. awesome. Yeah, I will. Cool. Um, and but yeah. yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, this has been really great. And you have a lot of like uh, insightful questions and it was really fun. <laughs> it's, it's good to hear that, uh, that you think that I ha have insightful questions. I was very nervous going into this. So, um, uh, <laughs> that, that's a little oh, bit that's reassuring, uh, but thank you. Um, and audience, thank you for listening. Hope you guys en uh, enjoyed this one. Um, and we'll see you guys next week. All right. Thank you so much for listening to the chill cast. I hope you liked it. Um, I'm actually gonna go now, and I'm gonna play with my friends, the fence in the yard. So, bye, I hope you have a good day.